Okay, so first of all, now I feel bad about how bad my slides were. The guy in the last room had these amazing handwritten slides that were like perfected. So I've tried to do my best by just uh, handwriting some slides. Uh, pretty amazing, as you'll see. Uh, so I am talking about Tor today, uh, as you might realize. And Tor, and it's two modes of operation. So out of everyone here, uh, hands up if you have uh, used Tor to access the internet, like uh, get around the block at university, school, something like that. Yep, quite a few people. Uh, hands up if you have brought illegal drugs on Tor. <laughs> There's always one. There's always one. Okay, so you've all passed the first challenge. Um, uh, also, I'm SS23, as mentioned. Uh, also go by Steven sometimes. Uh, so before we start, we'll talk about how Tor works. It's important to understand that. Uh, so here we are, here's a little graph. Got our Tor client here. This is what runs on the end user's computer. It will talk to this first guy here, who is some um, uh, contributed bandwidth. You know, this is one of the relays that you can run yourself. You could be this first guy here. Uh, and you'll encrypt a message that goes to him. Uh, then you'll pick another guy, and you'll send a message to this guy and say, hey, talk to this guy. And then that'll go across there, and you do the same with this one here. And because this is layered encryption, onions, right? That's where the name comes from. Uh, this guy here knows who you are, but not where you're going. This guy here knows neither who you are or where you're going. And this guy here only knows where you're going and not who you are. And that's the core of when you're accessing the clearnet, how the anonymity works. That no one person has enough information to de-anonymize you. Uh, this here is another slide that shows it. It's uh, pretty simple. It's got some more green arrows. This one here, even more simple. So you get the idea, Tor is pretty simple. Uh, hidden services, not so much. This one has much more arrows, and each of these little arrows here is an entire one of these things. And then here's another one, and this one has literal pictures of onions on it, so you know it's getting complicated. This one here has three different parts to it. This one here has like eight, and oh no, oh no, hidden services. They're pretty complicated. Uh, so we will briefly go over how it works. Uh, the hidden server there, he is Silk Road. He's always Silk Road. Uh, he talks to the directory service and says, hey, I'm Silk Road. If anyone wants to find me, go to this dude here. Uh, and then the client goes, hey, I want to go to Silk Road to buy some drugs. And it goes, hey, talk to him here. And then you talk to this guy, and you're like, I'm going to meet Silk Road here. And then Silk Road hears that you talk to him, and he goes, meet you there. Long story short, you get to talk to Silk Road. And each of these connections is also anonymized. So once again, you can talk to Silk Road. Silk Road doesn't know who you are and you don't know who Silk Road is. And that's how the Onion services work. It lets you host a website uh, reasonably resiliently that people can't take down, they don't know where it is, who's hosting it, anything like that. But of course, as per you might have imagined, there are some flaws with this idea. Um, like, this can happen. Uh, so what are we gonna go over? We're gonna go over some attacks on the protocol that Tor is not designed to protect against. It's really important to understand what Tor is gonna do for you and what it's not. Uh, we're going to go over some things that it is designed to predict against, but maybe doesn't do as well as it could. Uh, some attacks on the Tor software itself. Uh, some of the end user client software, like the Tor browser bundle. Attacks on end users being idiots, that one's always fun. And lastly, we'll go over some of the end user server software side of things, like our onion scan. So, threat modeling, everyone's favorite topic. Uh, it's really important to understand the Tor threat model and how it doesn't protect you from a global passive adversary. So if you are trying to hide yourself from the NSA or someone powerful like that, and of course the NSA is not a true global passive adversary, but they're pretty close, uh, you're going to have a bad time. These, these guys right here, uh, these people, not having a good time. Uh, would not recommend that. Um, so if a global passive adversary is trying to attack you and you're using Tor, you may be de-anonymized, but not necessarily decrypted. And of course, this does rely on monitoring the right traffic. But the threat model itself does not protect a global against a global passive adversary. There are certain steps you can take to help. It's not really going to help you. So don't make an enemy of the NSA. It's not going to work out well. Uh, protocol attacks. This is a great little paper here, which I think was one of the first papers that really talked about hidden services and some of their issues. It's very, very old now, um, before Tor was really in use much. Uh, and this was how you could de-anonymize those hidden services. Uh, so as we can see here, we have our client, who is also a relay, and he's running BSD, as hackers do. Uh, and the key point here is that if 
those three nodes that we talked about, if they have chosen equally from the entire pool of nodes and you run a node, all you need to do is do 100 connections, 1,000 connections, 10,000 connections, and eventually you'll be picked as that number one node, right? And so you can do traffic confirmation where you access Silk Road and you send through a 50-byte packet, and then you see a 50-byte packet come through on your Tor relay, and you say, okay, that could have been it, you do it again, and eventually you can get to the point where you can say, okay, someone is, I'm talking to Silk Road over this Tor relay. And then you can work out whether you're one, two, or three just based on, am I talking to the rendezvous point? I know that. Am I talking to two Tor servers? I know that. Or am I talking to one Tor server and another IP address so I don't know? Bam, you've now de-anonymized Silk Road. Uh, so this is kind of where a lot of the hidden services attacks have been going over the last 10 years or whatnot. Um, so they came up with a way to prevent it, of course. Uh, and this is the entry guard node. Uh, so this has two ways it works. First of all, it's an exclusive club that uh, only the cool nodes can join. So if you do not meet the cool criteria, you are not going to be able to hack anyone, buddy. Um, that means you have to have high bandwidth, you have to be stable, uh, people can't know you're hacking them. The Tor project don't like that, they, they shut you out pretty quick. Um, but you can be in that club. And the second prediction here is that once Silk Road picks uh, a set of entry guards, it will maintain that for a very long period. Because of course, even if you were in that club, if you weren't picked right away, and you had to wait six months for your next attempt, and it's still only a one in a 100,000 ish chance, really hard to carry out these attacks, right? So that's kind of the two ways that this can be done. Um, but of course, if a club isn't exclusive enough, enough, you can get into it, and you can just kill, or rather DDoS, everyone in the club, and then Silk Road has to choose to either go down or pick some new guard nodes. And hey, you might just run a lot of guard nodes. Um, so the kind of end result right now is if someone has a lot of money, they can probably de-anonymize de your hidden server. And you see this occasionally, uh, some of the darknet markets, the smart ones, will be like, hey, we've noticed a bunch of people attacking us. They haven't de-anonymized us, but they think, that we, they think that we think they might. We're going to stop running for a while. And if you were looking for this kind of attack, you could see it pretty clearly, right? You'd see a lot of uh, kind of relay attacks going on and you'd be like, okay, someone's trying to de-anonymize me, maybe we should ease off the drugs for a bit. Um, so someone did carry out this kind of attack on the Tor network live. Uh, there was a talk pulled from Black Hat back in 2014. Uh, it was basically talking about this kind of thing. I'm not presenting any attacks here, sorry, for anyone who wants to find some, uh, but these guys did. Uh, and they had some fancy ways of doing that traffic confirmation, kind of like in circuit, and some other things that made this attack a lot more viable. Uh, Tor got pulled, so we don't actually know all of the content, but we did see the attack happen on the Tor network, which gives us more data. And then when everyone was like, hey, CMU, did you guys do this? They said, no, it wasn't us, oh, we don't know what's happening. And then finally someone was like, you got paid for selling the exploit. And they were like, we did not get paid for that. So I was like, oh, really, that was, that was the problem? Uh, so of course, some people out there are trying to de-anonymize Tor servers and they have lots of money, thank you Mitch. Uh, but Tor is working hard to prevent these kind of attacks. So proposal 247, which sounds really fancy, defending against guard discovery attacks using vanguards. If guards aren't enough, we'll have vanguards. So they basically put more guards ahead of your guards that are kind of like guards. And the idea is now you have a tiered selection of guards where each guard is like guarding the other guards and then so before, where it was like you had to attack one guard, now there's guards on guards on guards you need to attack. Anyway, it's really good. It's kind of like exponentially increases the cost to be attacked. Um, it, and I, I mean, I'm not a cryptographer, but it looks pretty good to me. So this is being looked at, being implemented, and I think it's gonna go through, which is good. Um, but at the moment, there's kind of that weakness there. There's also been a bunch of changes lately around uh, the next gen hidden services. Uh, but this is more of kind of like a cleanup you might have seen they now have longer names. That's because they're using more crypto. Uh, they're switching from RSA to elliptic curve cryptography, that kind of thing. So they are making changes all the time to make these things more secure, better, that kind of thing. Uh, attacks on the Tor daemon. You're gonna have a bad time, buddy. Uh, this is the CVE search from a little while ago. There have been eight CVEs on the Tor daemon over the life of it. That's a uh, that's very low number for those who know about CVEs. Uh, so good luck with that. If you find some, great, but I just don't think it's very likely. Contrast that to attacks on the Tor browser bundle. For those who know Firefox, 
going to be a little bit more fruitful. Uh, 1,468, that was like, I got the screenshot like six months ago. It's probably doubled by now, tripled, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be running Firefox. Um, so that's, that's where a lot more of these kind of non-protocol attacks happen. Uh, sad. Uh, and it is the most common attack people care about. We saw when the FBI had a coordinated takedown of uh, Freedom Hosting, which was kind of the biggest core hoster at the time. They hosted uh, anything. So a bunch of sites that weren't dodgy, but a bunch that were horrific, like, like child abuse and anything else you can imagine that's bad, Freedom Hosting was doing it. Uh, FBI took it down, and what they did is they put JavaScript on every page that was hosted on Freedom Hosting and de-anonymized any user. So it had some collateral damage, right? Because if you were just hosting a blog there, well, you've also been de-anonymized. But you know, uh, point is that they can they can use these attacks on people, and they do. They take someone down, put this JavaScript in. So what are the mitigations? You could migrate to a secure browser, uh, Chrome, though that has its own issues. I would not recommend that. But if someone invested the time, you could do it. Um, you could rewrite Firefox in a memory safe language, which I used to think was a hilarious joke that someone would do that. But I see Firefox is doing it now. They're rewriting in Rust. So uh, I'm not so sure anymore. Um, so yeah, it's been talked about briefly. It's a huge undertaking, but I guess they're doing it. So that will hopefully help. If you're using a memory safe language, maybe Firefox would be a little bit better now. Um, alternative mitigation is use NoScript. Like if you go to buy drugs and someone's like, hey, do you want to turn on JavaScript for these drugs? We have like great pop-ups and like we do all this JavaScript frontendy stuff or recite. Don't do it. It's a trap. Uh, I would definitely recommend using NoScript. Uh, attacks on end user idiocy. So these are the funny people. Like what if you don't want to be in an exam? And so you just, you just send a bomb threat, right? But you do it over Tor so you don't get caught. Uh, and then you get out of your exam. And the FBI comes, because they don't like bomb threats, it turns out. They're pretty pretty against them. Uh, and then the administrators of the school are just looking at the logs, right? And they're like, who was using Tor at the time of the bomb threat? Oh, it was that one guy in that dorm? We might go have a talk with him. Uh, so you can't just use Tor and be like, I'm anonymous. No one can find me. It doesn't quite work like that, right? You stick out pretty bad while using it. Uh, now, the mitigation here is don't crack under interrogation, because just using Tor alone isn't enough to get you put in prison. But this guy got interviewed by the FBI, came knocking on his door, did you do that? And he was just like, yeah, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. What have I done? Uh, so don't, don't talk to the police, man. You better get caught. Uh, OK, now we are into the fun stuff. And I hope I'm not going too fast or too slow. Uh, who cares about Firefox exploits being on top of Apache and PHP, man? Users, who cares about that? I want to pop Silk Road. Um, so. We got some demos for you. Yeah, here we are, XXX demo time. So we're gonna be looking at onion scan. So this was some sweet software written by someone called Sarah. Oh no, uh, oh, Twitter notifications. I really thought that wouldn't happen this time. <laughs> I don't even have the Twitter tab open and it's still happening. Uh, okay, where are we? Uh, hang on, I think, there we are, okay. Uh, we go into this window here. Oh, disconnected. Let's hope my internet is still working. So we're going to start off. <laughs> we are going to start off with running onion scan because it takes a little while. Uh, I think I've got something here. Okay, so I've got the host name there. I've got onion scan running. It's the URL. Um, onion scan scans onions, funnily enough, and it tries to find issues with their security. So this. <laughs> oh. Okay, uh, just give me, give me one second here. Uh, can I just, uh, this is not easy. No, let's leave it. Um, <laughs> I think we might have a code of conduct violation on our hands soon. Okay, so I did, <laughs> I did apt-get install Apache, apt-get install Tor, uh, and configured Tor to listen to this uh, website. So here's the website. It's you could go to this now if you want to. I it's just the default Apache page. Nothing, right? If you install Apache out of the box, it's going to be secure, is what you might think. But you might be wrong. Um, if you go to slash server status, as you might expect, forbidden. You do not have permission. Oh, sorry. Um, but uh, I'm going to say onion scan is still going. So we'll let that finish. But if we go over here, this is the Tor page if you've never used it before. This is what comes up when you open Tor. It's like, yay, Tor, protecting people, yay, pretty good. Uh, and it's like, oh yeah, you're gonna get hacked, bro, don't worry about that. Um, 
Anyway, here we are. Here's the same site, posted over Tor, exact same thing. But now, I'm going to server status. I won't get distracted. I won't get distracted. <laughs> here we are. Now, you might be wondering, what on earth has happened here? And uh, you might be super sleuth and realize that it's all like 127.0.0.1. That's because, of course, Tor is talking to Apache over localhost. And Apache is port. If you're connecting to me over the local address, you are clearly trusted. You are on the system, you're fine. Not the page. Uh, so the information exposed by a default server status page out of the box is enough to really cause havoc. Uh, these are just what happens when you run a server on the internet, right? Um, but there's often a lot of information in here, enough that you can be completely de Um And if you had any other status pages, if you ever had uh, something like an admin panel that just is like, oh, your local host, you'll probably be okay, you're going to be screwed here as well. So uh, it's kind of one of the weird interactions between Tor and the other stuff. So here we are. I'm going to scan RAN. It checks a lot of stuff. It checks uh, for things like uh, images, fav icons, uh, any clear text links, uh, SSH keys. Anything it can use to uh, link together different services or de-anonymize you, it's going to search for that. It's a really great tool if you're interested in this stuff, and it covers most of the basic stuff. So if you do run Darknet Market, you check out Onion Scan. Um, yeah, why this is bad? It's very bad. Um, I'll just quickly show you the Tor config. So you can see what's kind of happening. Where are we? Is that readable? It's not readable, is it? It's okay. Hang on. Give me one second. I will think of getting parent. Somewhere here, there's a, oh, here we are, font. Yeah, you can tell I'm a pro at doing talks, right? So 48, that'll be good enough. Why? Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, somewhere here. Here we are, hidden service there. You actually can't see it. Hidden service there. All I've done in the default config is uncomment out this line and this line. So you sneak back on port 80 to yourself and set up a directory for storing that stuff. That is onion scan. That is a tool you can use to make sure you are not going to be hacked if you are running dodgy websites. Okay, we're going to go back into presentation mode where the uh, notifications will go away. I really hope at least. <laughs> Look at that, they're gone. Ha ha ha. Okay, so that was Onion Scan. I hope that helps. Check it out. Uh, she does like a bunch of other research. Uh, one of the things she does is um, quantifying exactly how many sites there are of which kinds on the internet. So if you ever thought to yourself, like, oh, 100% of sites on the dark net are just the ho most horrible atrocious websites, they're mainly not. They're mainly just dodgy people doing dodgy things that aren't quite that dodgy. Um, she's quantified a lot of that and kind of done some stuff. There's another weakness in how hidden services work at the moment that you can actually kind of enumerate them. With enough time, you can list every site hosted on Tor. Uh, they're kind of fixing that. I think you can't even do it right now, but there was for a long time that, so you could quantify it exactly, what percentage of sites are dodgy. Um, here we are. The default install of Apache, uh, it's localhost, form hack. Uh, you've got to be aware of that stuff when you're running a site, especially if you take off the shelf software, right? Like Apache, you would think it'd be secure. It's actually not for reasons. Um, now, Silk Road had some other stuff going on here, right? Like, one of the core issues is that if you have insecure software on your server, which, spoiler alert, you totally do. And someone hacks it, and they can just go, curl what is my IP.com. Like, that's a really horrible situation to be in. Uh, so Silk Road, uh, this is a Reddit thread where someone logged in, and they saw just a massive amount of debugging information on the front page, including clear text IP addresses. And uh, for those who don't know, that's because Dreadfire Roberts was like a really good PHP developer. He did everything in production. He was just like, I'll dump that. Yeah, I'll see what, what that is. Uh, and it had a bunch of stuff that could have been used to de-anonymize. Um, so, you know, like, that's kind of what's going to happen. Someone's going to leak some information eventually. But you need to stop putting your hidden services on the public internet. They don't need public internet access. All they need is to access Tor. That is it. Um, the other problem here is that if you have three different hidden services, or even just one server serving some hidden services and some not, you can, you can do things like SSH keys, timestamps. You can correlate those and just be like, oh, I'm pretty sure it's rigged from down the road. 
you get the exact same timestamp down to the nanosecond, things like that. Uh, so these are two things you can do to stop these kind of attacks happening. Now, I made freedom host. Do you get it? It's like freedom hosting, but it's dumb. So it's free dumb host. Uh, so it's a set of tools for hosting a uh, company platform infrastructure. Uh, it's based on the Grax portal of Pi, which for those who don't know, that is basically the same kind of idea. If you want to access Tor uh, and you don't want to get hacked, you can set up a little Raspberry Pi that acts as a Tor router, plug that into your computer and turn off the Wi-Fi and everything, and now you're guaranteed to be going to Tor. Even if someone did one of those Firefox exploits on you, it doesn't matter because you, that computer could be completely owned. It still can't get past the Raspberry Pi that's acting kind of like a firewall here. They'd have to have like a Linux uh, remote exploit or an exploit in the Tor uh, daemon itself, which it doesn't seem particularly likely. So this is one way to prevent that happening, and this is kind of how Freedom Host came about. It doesn't require anyone to trust the service because if you're signing up for a, a host on the internet and it's free, you just be like, give me one. And Freedom Host is just going to be like, sure, buddy. I don't have anything to verify you with. Um, so then you get a virtual machine, right? You log into that. You don't need to trust the person who's hosting the virtual machine because they can't know who you are. There is no way for them to know who you are and vice versa. So that's how Freedom Hosting works. And of course, because I am very smart, I ran this in the real world. As I said, it was free. And I just gave anyone on tour a free virtual machine. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I think if you do it for free and you say it's research, like they let you off. So uh, I think I'm okay, but I did it anyway. Oh, uh, let's skip over that one because I didn't take that out clearly. Um, <laughs> so uh, how did it go, right? I had two people emailing me whenever the service went down. Uh, so if you think like normal people are bad, poor users, they can be quite bad as well. Uh, be like, yes, it's down. I'll be like, I know I unplugged it. It's, it's down. Uh, there were multiple uh, political and informational blogs. And this is one of the really interesting things for me is that there were just people wanting to put out like weird opinions out there. People just wanted to have a place where they can host some website, especially for free, because even on the clear net, like, getting a free website is kind of hard. So there was that kind of thing. It was an ITP proxy service. So ITP is another anonymization network thing. Uh, now, I'm guessing this was someone who wanted to like use my bandwidth to contribute to their network, which is fine. Like I'm all for that. And I think it's like a really interesting use of kind of free services is like promoting more anonymity and stuff. Uh, there was one like send Bitcoin, receive child pornography site. It was like purely text, but I can see all that because I run the virtual machines, so I immediately delete it. So like it's really interesting because what do you think of when you think give anyone on tour a free virtual machine? Like, if you're anything like me, you probably thought, like, hell no, that is going to work out really bad. And it actually works out OK, at least for the amount of time I did it. Um, so I would totally recommend that you have, a, just to think at least about doing this. If you have something to uh, contribute, bandwidth, servers, maybe you should look at doing something like this and getting a first-hand experience of what's actually on tour and why you might support it, that kind of thing. Um, so I will briefly go over the architecture. You have uh, physical Raspberry Pi, once again. You could replace this with any server. Uh, I had so many issues with just like running Tor on a Raspberry Pi. Turns out those aren't powerful. Who knew? Um, so that, that was a cause of frustration for me. Uh, each Raspberry Pi just runs uh, Tor daemon and configuration management. That's all it runs. Each virtual machine's in its own VLAN. They can never talk to each other. This is a management VLAN. Oh. Uh, and there's transparent IP tables rules that route everything over Tor. So even if you pop the virtual machine, you get nothing. If you then previous can use a hypervisor escape, you still have nothing. Um, and I've got some O'Day, so I would like someone to do that. Uh, and then only if you find a bug in the Tor daemon or something like that, or in IP tables, do you then have a chance of de-anonymizing the server, which is kind of like the ideal situation if you are running a darknet market. And I would hope if someone like shells your server and then does a guest to host, I'd hope you'd have some way of figuring that out like before it gets to the point you're de-anonymized. So that's kind of the hardened freedom hosting uh, situation. Uh, yeah, so it's all running on separate physical hardware apart from the virtual machines. And it's hardened Gentoo based, which back when I made it was actually a viable thing to do. Now hardened Gentoo doesn't exist because of the whole GRSec thing. So maybe I've got a BSD in the future. But that is freedom hosting. And then you can go back there. There's Oh, geez. Somewhere there was a GitHub link in there. 
uh, which you can check it out. It's on my GitHub or on Freedom Hostings on GitHub. You can check out the code and run it. And there we are. Does anyone have any questions or anything like that? Are we doing questions? Ideally not. Okay, no questions. But you can come and see me after. If anyone has a question, you're now welcome to ask again. Uh, I so the question was how long did I run it for? I'm gonna say around six months, but it wasn't running the whole time because I was developing it as I was running it. So this is a, like a two-year-long project, and you have to get hardware and stuff. Uh, I'd say around six months, but yeah. Yeah. So the question was how can you detect or like is there a way to detect dodgy site? Now I believe if if you talk to like DAA or you know the right people, you can get hashes of uh, images that you really don't want on your server. That's one of the detection mechanisms is just to hash every image coming through. And if you have a list of uh, bad hashes, you can immediately shut down these sites. Uh, keywords would probably also work, but you run the risk of shutting down sites. In this case, I don't think there's a big risk of like shutting down a legit site because it's free. Like I don't care. You can just re remake it. Um, so there are some ways of doing it, but I think it's going to be manually a lot of the time because what constitutes bad? If they're new images, if uh, it's just a site dedicated to something really horrific but there's no images, you're probably going to have to look at this stuff yourself, which is a real downside if you did want to run this is that you have to be constantly monitoring because you, you don't want to, especially in my case, my rules were nothing immoral. If you wanted to run Silk Road, like go ahead, I'm all for drugs. But if you wanted to run something else, uh, then no, you're not allowed. I'm going to be checking that. I'm going to be shutting this down. And I guess I'm lucky I didn't have to deal with any of that. But automating it is a tough job. Maybe it'd be interesting to do as a project. Yeah. No, so the question was, is it manually approved? And the answer is no. It was literally, like I wish I had it running right now to just show you. You literally click a button and it waits 30 seconds and then it says, okay, your virtual machine's ready. These are the details, log in. You've got root on a virtual machine right away. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was fast, it was free, it was just click it and get it. Which is how like a lot of this free stuff should be. Especially on Tor, where you don't want to give away personal information, why not just make it instant? And you can't really vet over Tor anyway. Like, Greg McGregs base, like, is he going to do it on your stuff? How do you know? Like, are you going to ask for personal information? Well, then it kind of defeats the purpose. So, yeah. Yeah? I think we're about good. Sweet. <laughs>